A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If you are listened to, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If that person refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I Truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, that I am there among them. Will you pray with me? Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Say a word that they might hear. These words of my own are futile if not empowered by your life-giving presence. So take this weak vessel, these lips of clay, and say life-giving things. You are indeed our rock and our redeemer in whom I place my trust. Amen. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. That verse has been coming back to me in the last few months because it seems that all that any of the sociologists and church specialists can talk about is people leaving the church. And I'm sure you've been hearing of all about the leaving. In the last few months, my email inbox and my social media feeds have been flooded with articles and studies about the steep decline in church attendance and participation. And if you look at those social media posts and then read the comments, I, I would normally tell you not to read the comments. But in response to those articles, there have been thousands of people who've taken to the comment sections to tell their stories about why people are leaving churches, why themselves are personally staying, or why they left long ago. And one book has just been published that referred to this current religious phenomenon of falling church attendance as the great de-churching of America. The claim is that America is de-churching very fast, much like Europe not solely out of animosity or loss of belief by those who are leaving, but because families are unsure what role the church can now play in their current work and family life, uh, where the role of the church is in the public square. People have questions about the fundamental shift and changes in this thing that we call church. And then just last week, a Presbyterian minister wrote a widely read and circulated article about leaving the church as pastor, enumerating several reasons he did so, including burnout and conflict and the consumerist rather than spiritual behavior of the bulk of church members. I'm sure this article came across your desk. But I also lost count of all the articles, think pieces, and social media hot takes in response to that one article. It's just been going on and on. Yes, I'm tired of it. And back and forth, ministers and lay people debating one man's unique perspective about his personal reasons for leaving church. And I decided I had to disengage from it. It was way too much. But as I reflected on it, I think the reason that article and these articles about people leaving are 
so uppermost in our thinking, in our conversation, our mind, is because it is forcing us to confront our anxieties about the dramatic changes that are taking place in church and in church life. There's so much change that's going on. All of this discussion, debating, and worrying about church, though, highlights a truth. A truth often unspoken or at least overlooked in some of our nostalgic, apologetic commitments to the church we know and grown up with. But there is a truth that it highlights. And that truth is, it is not easy to be church. It is not easy for people to gather from their across differences and beliefs and worldviews and experiences and be church. This is, the rea- this is the reality that surrounds our choice to gather in church, to gather uh, in this place. It, 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 it is this challenge that we encounter in our attempt to be faithful. It simply is not easy to do it. Now, it should bring us some comfort to know that our scripture text demonstrates that it was not easy to be church even when Jesus himself walked among the faithful. Yes, Church folk gave Jesus trouble. In his encounter and ministry with the actual lived experience of the people he served, Jesus knew that human beings will hurt one another. Jesus knew that in our humanness, we hurt one another. We fight, we fuss, we feud, we mistrust each other, we fail to be gentle with each other, we are susceptible to feelings of envy, resentment, and sometimes even hate. So Jesus speaks to this reality even among the people around him and offers to them a means by which they can remain gathered rather than pulled apart because of the reality of inevitable conflict. How can we stay together when it gets hard to be together? And so Jesus offers what looks like a procedural matter. It's a process for accountability, reconciliation, forgiveness that that Jesus lays out. It, it, it It is a response to the messy humanness of of people coming together. And the reason I say it is a response to messy humanness is because this teaching that Jesus does about how to deal with the conflict between two people, it comes right after the disciples were having a discussion about who is the greatest in the kingdom. See, you already about to stratify themselves by wondering who is greatest. And so Jesus feels called, I believe, to, 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 see, to talk about how do you stay together when we start talking about how much better I am than you. So this comes after that conversation. It comes after Jesus taught the disciples to display the humility, powerlessness, and marginality of a child as a mark of true greatness. After Jesus cautioned his followers not to cause anybody to stumble in their life of spiritual growth and journey. After Jesus told the parable of the shepherd who loves a lost sheep so much that they would sacrifice everything just to gain that one which was lost. So this, this Matthew reports a saying of Jesus about how to deal with that inevitable moment when we sin against one another in the context of the ecclesia or church. And I think it's worth pointing out here. It's worth pointing out that Jesus refers to this faithful people gathered around him as a church. 
even though they did not gather in the kinds of houses of worship like the one we're sitting in today. They didn't have this one beautiful grand hall that they went to every week to be church. They had to be church wherever and whenever they were. And even in that context, Jesus wanted to talk about how do you remain church? How do you remain together? So Jesus emphasizes here that whenever and wherever you gather, you must continuously operate with the posture of repair, reconciliation, and restoration. Operate from that place that no matter what you encounter, no matter where you are, operate from a posture of repair, reconciliation, and restoration so that you can remain church when you inevitably disagree with each other or hurt each other. This process for direct dealing, making things right, forgiving and making amends and seeking to be reconciled is a recognition, a recognition, and I want us to recognize it too. It is a recognition that we have to work at being church. That's not sexy and that's not dramatic. But there's nothing spiritually, spiritually magic about gathering here every Sunday, about gathering in community. We have to work at being church. We have to keep showing up, keep loving each other, keep regaining each other, keep reconciling with each other, keep restoring those who are lost. We have to work at it. It is not automatic. It is not easy. Our life together is about accountability and forgiveness so that whatever we encounter, we repair it, we reconcile, we restore. We have to work at being church. And so this means, and I know some people thought, you know, when we read the scripture, we're going to go through that, that process for go, go and talk to someone and bring someone else along and, and get a witness. Uh, yeah, it's a great process. But I think, let me, let me pull it this way. I think this is less about conflict management and best practices for healthy confrontation. It's less about that, which, by the way, we don't have to worry about because we got any number of resources to tell us how to fight better. But that's not what I think is the most important part. This is less about conflict management and, and, and best practices for health, healthy confrontation than a discipleship. Discipleship shaped by a spirit and posture of repair, reconciliation, and restoration. A church that prioritizes repairing what's wrong. A church that prioritizes reconciling with one another. A church that prioritizes restoring relationship amid Conflict and discord and disagreement is a church with divine authority. What are you talking about, preacher? It says in the scripture, Jesus just said it. If you are together in a spirit of repair, reconciliation, restoration, I am there with you and I bind what you do because of it. A church that prioritizes repair, reconciliation, and restoration amid discord and disagreement is a church with the divine authority, recognized and ratified by God, a place where God is present. And if God is present amid that kind of people, people out there, people surrounded by a world in conflict, a world that is violent, a world that is polarized. People out there will want to be community with us in here. If we live out the, the, the life of a people who believe in repair, reconciliation, restoration, people will choose us as their community. If 
The church can be a place of accountability and forgiveness. I believe people will choose church. If we live, work, and serve with an orientation that reflects the covenantal commitments of a God who loves, forgives, and reconciles with us all the time, then people will choose church. Now, I think it's worth pointing out, and some of you may know this, this very scripture, this very text that outlines a biblical reconciliation process, has been misused to shame, belittle, and excommunicate people from church. It has been used to, 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 to belittle and shame people who have been divorced, people who have LGBTQ children or who are LGBTQ themselves, people who have, who have questioned the, the decisions of the leadership, this text has been used to silence people. This text has also been misused to quietly sleep, sweep under the rug sexual abuse and assault, the, the sexual abuse of women, the denial of women's ministries, financial malfeasance and ministerial misconduct by arguing for a closed process that makes transparency and accountability impossible. That's not what Jesus was talking about in this text. Because whatever goes wrong in the church, whatever has been done wrong, whoever has been hurt, our every act should be, made, should be to make the community whole again. Whatever goes wrong, however much we disagree, our, we must, we must, our every act, must be to expand and sustain the circle of care and concern for the offender and the offended. Whatever goes on, our every act should be to show love, mercy, and forgiveness for those who stay and for those who decide to leave. Just as Jesus shows love, mercy, and forgiveness to the Gentile and the tax collector. In the end, a church of repair, reconciliation, and restoration is all about building up people. No matter what the breach in relationship is. That is our job. And so what is lost in all of the talk about people leaving the church the talk about the church's future as we know it, about the status of the familiar organizations we grew up in. What's lost in all that talk is that people desire to be a part of a community. People are just looking to be seen, heard, embraced, and accepted. People are looking for that gospel of love and liberation that often eludes us out there in a world that simply sees people only as voters, consumers, and taxpayers. And so if, if we keep uppermost in our mind that our work and witness, the thing that Jesus cared most about, is that we be the gathered people that show love to all who come. I love the way Archbishop Desmond Tutu talks about this orientation toward repair, reconciliation, and restoration. You've probably heard him talk about the concept of Ubuntu. We, we sometimes talk about it and skip right over it. But Desmond Tutu, I think, is getting at this nub about how do we be that kind of community. And he talked about the philosophy of it. Ubuntu is, he says, the philosophy and belief that a person is only a person through other people. We are human only in relation to other humans. Our humanity is bound up in one another. And any tear in the fabric of connection between us must be repaired for all of us to be made whole. This interconnectedness is the very root of who we are. Umbutu says, I am incomplete without you. And whenever possible, we must do the hard work to rebuild right relations with one another. Because enemies can become friends and perpetrators can recover their humanity. We have to be church 
And we have to work at being it. We have to keep showing up and trying over and over and over again. And there is timeless wisdom. Timeless wisdom in the reconciling with of each other and the restoring those who may become estranged from our beloved community. Embodying and enacting the love, generosity, and forgiveness of the God who showed that to us, who shows that to us. Enacting and embodying that love makes sure that God is present here. That God is present wherever we are. Whether here in this sanctuary, whether on the southern border with immigrant families, whether in shelters, food shelves, or encampments, whether in sites of protest or resistance in the public sphere, or in the halls of power and centers of commerce, or in your local store, God is pleased to dwell with those who have a heart for reconciliation and restoration. And if we have that heart, if we have that heart here at this place, I believe we wouldn't have room enough for the people to come. And God will be pleased to dwell with us all there. Praise be to God.